Okay, thanks, thanks Liz. Um, and I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to take part in this meeting. As Liz said, I also um, work at the International Institute for Environment and Development. I should immediately tell you that I work in the Human Settlements Programme with a very strong focus on urban issues, particularly urban poverty and urban inequality. Um, I was invited particularly to take part in this panel, not because I have any capacity to answer the question that's posed, but because some years ago I was involved in a seminar and following that a book which explored the rights-based approach in more detail. And the book, the volume, Rights-Based Approaches to Development, Exploring the Potential and Pitfalls, drew together a set of academics and practitioners who were interested in, committed to the rights-based approach, and who at that point had had some experience with realizing it. It was very much a, um, a discussion, and following that, and the elaboration of a discussion which looked at some of the challenges which emerged. And I think it's some of those challenges that I was asked to elaborate for you this afternoon. I think I would just say, perhaps by way of beginning, that we recognize that the context in which the rights-based approach has grown to fashion was very much one that engages with this um, binary divide that's posed by the question. The rights-based approach emerged in a context in which the market approach to development had become very dominant. There was a concern among many, many people that, the, that, 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 I had, that had ended up with a very high cost to some of the lowest income and most disadvantaged citizens. And perhaps, I think in some sense, lawyers were seen as a strong enough profession to challenge the dominance of economists. So we recognize that was the context in which it had emerged. Also, I think relevant in that context, was one in which large development agencies, sometimes governments, had recognized they lacked an accountability to the people they sought to help. So the rights-based approach was also recognized for being important in changing the relationship of the state of professional groups away from being patrons, away from having beneficiaries, but towards recognizing a much more equitable relationship with those that they were seeking to support. That said, I think one of the things that our discussion highlighted was that it's not necessarily that simple. And I think there was a concern, certainly among some of those who shared this debate, that the rights-based approach has become somewhat of a simplistic package of measures, often leg led by legal institutions to address what is necessarily a very set of very complex and diverse problems on the ground. I wanted, I think, just to highlight three particular problems that we elaborate, because they seem to me to have a relevance that, that is, is of potential to your debate this afternoon. I think the first of those that a number of the papers um, discuss and resonates very much with my experience of working with grassroots organizations of the urban poor is that rights do not av avoid problems of power and embedded advantage. There are many groups, low-income groups that I work with in urban centers, for example, who would not trust the courts or the legal system to deliver for them, who would feel um, excluded from that kind of discourse, even groups who feel nervous when they are supported by professionals because they feel they're being taken onto a discourse that they cannot compete with, that will necessarily disadvantage them. I'm sure I don't need to tell many of you about court outcomes that clearly favor the most powerful social groups. Perhaps a little bit more pertinent to your own focus, one of the papers in the book talks about a particularly ethnic group in, in the Cameroon that used the rights-based approach successfully, but who were already in a strong market position. The women within that group who were not in a strong social position could not benefit from this approach. So I think one, one clear finding that we had was that problem that, that the powerful can use whatever system, and they have used the rights-based approach, as indeed they've used the markets-based approach. I think the second um, conclusion, in a way, that, that I'd also like to highlight is that the rights-based approach may encourage people to make claims and demand entitlements from the state, but that may actually not be what people need in order to address their needs. I'm not sure how much relevance this has to your own considerations, but certainly the groups that I work with, 
that try and address their shelter issues. Whilst they would very much see themselves as working with the state to address those issues, they are utterly unconfident of the state delivering shelter to them. That does not work for them. What is more important to them is a right to participate in developing solutions rather than a right to have those solutions um, in a kind of as a fixed content, for example. So not so much a right to services, but a right to work out how those services should be provided and what should be delivered. I think the third point I just highlight that, that also potentially has some resonance is the fact that one of the strong conclusions coming out of a paper from UNICEF, but accepted by others who participated in this debate, <laughs> is that rights may not necessarily help in identifying what is the most important needs that need to be addressed and in allocating resources to address those needs. Uh, in some cases, I think the agencies felt rights had been used too crudely. And so groups were continuing to pursue a right even though the costs of getting 100% coverage were very high. And indeed, a more cost-effective approach might be to shift to other needs. But how much did the rights, based, rights approach help them deal with that? I think a fourth point that I'd just also like to perhaps to highlight, which very much comes out of this, is that although the approaches may have developed as kind of a binary division, as a dichotomy, they, of course, should not be seen in that way. In that markets, of course, depend on rights. Do people have a right to individual property? Do they have a right to collective property? You cannot entirely avoid the problem of, um, you cannot separate the creation of markets from the instrument of rights. So in awareness, perhaps, going back to the initial point that I made about legal system, but more broadly in terms of state institutions, that the way in which rights are constituted has profound implications for the way in which markets function. So I think the kind of conclusion at the end of this volume, and indeed the discussions I have with many groups, is that the, the rights themselves do not offer a solution. That we need to advance beyond this, this sense that it, 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 it um, solves problems, to recognising that judgments need to be formed. To, re to thinking about what rights should be produced, how should those rights be realised, to whom are institutions that deliver on those rights accountable, how can those rights be modified. At the same time as issues around markets, how should markets be regulated, who should be included, who should be excluded, and what are the very real consequences of strengthening state institutions which can both support grassroots-led development but can also undermine grassroots-led development. So I guess if you want a simple story from my presentation is that it's all a little bit more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Diana.